In this video, I will teach you what you need to know and simplify T-cell activation, MHC1 versus MHC2, and T-helper cells. This is a very complicated, very detailed immunology topic that medical students and other graduate health studies students really struggle with. So I want to simplify all of this and make it super understandable. Let's start by talking about major histocompatibility complex. So when you see MHC, sometimes written as MHC1 and MHC2, that MHC acronym stands for major histocompatibility complex. The short and sweet of this is that it is a molecule that presents antigens to T cells to activate them as part of our immune system. So there's MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1, it collects peptides endogenous in the cytosol, whereas MHC2 collects exogenous peptides and those get stored in intracellular vesicles. So MHC1, for that reason, tends to present viral antigens. MHC2 tends to present bacterial antigens. MHC1 interacts with cytotoxic T cells or CD8 T cells, whereas MHC2 interacts with helper T cells or CD4 cells. Now, if you're wondering what is this CD business that I keep hearing about, if you see CD blank, where the blank is any number, all that refers to is the expression of some compound or some marker. So when we say CD8 T cells, we're saying T cells that have this little thing sticking out on them that we call CD8. So it's just a way of like planting a flag on the cell and saying this flag is CD8, which means this cell expresses this marker or this compound. It's just a way to identify various cells. Now, the thing that you need to know is the rule of eight. This is a really handy way to memorize the interactions between the MHCs and CD4 versus CD8 cells. So the rule says that if you multiply the number from the CD times the number from the MHC, it'll always equal eight. So for example, CD8 cells will interact with MHC1 because one times eight equals eight. And likewise, CD4 cells will interact with MHC2 because four times two equals eight. This is a really handy way to memorize this for USMLE and Comlex. So now what I wanna do is go through the nitty gritty details and simplify the physiology of what's happening at our MHC1 and MHC2 in order to activate the immune response. So I'm gonna simplify all of this, but before we get into these fine details, let's just take one step back and look at the big picture. Major histocompatibility complex, or MHCs, bind antigens and present those antigens to T cells. The consequence of this is that if it's a viral infected cell or a bacterial infected cell, it doesn't matter, but the goal is that we take a piece of that pathogen, we show the T cell to either activate macrophages and kill the bacteria or kill the pathogen, or alternatively, have our B cells activate, differentiate, and produce antibodies that allow us to have a memory about the offending pathogen. So that's the reason that your MHC presents these antigens. It's to kill cells that have the virus or the bacteria or to get B cells to undergo the process of antibody production. So let's start by looking at what happens when MHC1 presents a viral antigen. So we see the viral antigen sitting on MHC1 and this is on an antigen presenting cell or a dendritic cell. In addition to MHC1, that antigen presenting cell has a B7 protein. Now on your exam, you might see it written as B7 protein. You also might see it written as a CD80 fragment or a CD86 fragment. These are all semi-interchangeable, but the B7, CD80, CD86, that's also expressed on the antigen presenting cell in addition to your MHC1. Now what happens is a T cell, in this case a cytotoxic T cell, 
will come along with its T cell receptor. In addition to its T cell receptor, we know that it's a CD8 T cell, which means it expresses that CD8 marker. And we know that because it's interacting with MHC1. Remember, one times eight equals eight. That's the rule of eight. In addition to the T cell receptor and the CD8 marker, it also expresses CD28. So step one of this interaction between the antigen presenting cell presenting viral antigen on MHC1 is that your T cell receptor and CD8 recognizes the viral antigen and activates the T cell. To strengthen this interaction, CD28 from the T cell interacts with B7 protein, or again, CD80, CD86, and that secondary process is called co-stimulation. Essentially, it strengthens the connection, the recognition, the bond between antigen-presenting cells presenting viral antigen on MHC1 and T cells recognizing that viral antigen so that it can activate and become a cytotoxic T cell. Now, after all of these connections and after the recognition of the viral antigen, you activate the cytotoxic T cell and directly kill the viral infected cell. So this is an example of how MHC1 interacts with cytotoxic T cells on an antigen presenting cell. Now let's look at the alternative example, in this case, MHC2. So MHC2 has a bacterial antigen. In this case, it's a B cell, and the expression of that B cell is going to have a marker for CD40. What happens is a helper T cell comes along with its T cell receptor, and it expresses the CD4 marker which again, you already know because we've gone over the rule of eight. And since we're talking about MHC2, two times four equals eight, therefore it has to be CD4. So the T cell receptor will interact with MHC2 to recognize the bacterial antigen. And in this interaction, CD40 interacts with CD40 ligand. And that's kind of easy to remember because it's literally CD40 and the ligand for CD40. So a little bit easier to memorize the co-stimulatory signal in this example. Now your helper T cells are going to recognize the specific bacterial antigen and once that happens you are going to have the release of cytokines and these will activate the B cell and then the B cell can undergo class switching, affinity maturation, and antibody production. So this is a very granular, detailed process. Big picture, again, just to kind of make this simple so that you're not feeling overwhelmed, is if you have viral antigen, MHC1 presents that to a cytotoxic T cell, which becomes activated after co-stimulation. And if you have bacterial antigen, MHC2 presents that to helper T cells, after co-stimulation, which causes cytokine release, class switching, affinity maturation, and antibody production. Now what happens here is you have various T cell differentiation pathways. So you start with Th0, right? The zero indicates that it has not yet undergone a differentiation pathway but there are many different outcomes that this helper T cell or this TH0, when you see TH, just think T helper, that this undifferentiated TH0 helper T cell can undergo. The first path is that your TH0 helper T cells can differentiate into TH1 cells. What promotes this path is IL-12 and interferon gamma, and what prevents this path is IL-4 and IL-10. Once the undifferentiated helper T, Th0 cells become Th1 cells, those Th1 cells stimulate macrophage production. So this is the pathway that you would look toward for granuloma formation and macrophage phagocytosis. Now something that's important for USMLE and COMLEX is that 
the macrophage produces IL-12 and the Th1 cell produces interferon gamma. And because, as you see in that gray box on the top of this slide, because both IL-12 and interferon gamma promote the differentiation of Th0 undifferentiated helper cells into Th1 cells, this is a positive feedback pathway. So the more IL-12 from macrophages causes more Th0 to go to Th1, the more interferon gamma from Th1 causes even more Th0 to go to Th1, and this cascade compiles and compiles and leads to more Th1 and more macrophage activity. This is very high yield to understand. The other pathway that Th0 undifferentiated helper cells can take is that they can become Th2 cells. What happens here, what promotes this is IL-4 and IL-10, and what inhibits this path is IL-12 and interferon gamma. Once you have Th2 cells, they cause B cells to transform into plasma cells, and this is the pathway whereby we have antibody production and humoral immunity. Now, let's pause for a second and point out something very important. Please note that the stimulation from Th0 to Th1 and the stimulation from Th0 to Th2, these are opposites. So IL-12 interferon gamma promote Th0 to Th1, but they inhibit Th0 to Th2. Likewise, Th0 to Th1 is inhibited by IL-4 and IL-10, but Th0 to Th2 is promoted by IL-4 and IL-10. And this makes perfect sense because if you need to go from undifferentiated helper T cells into Th2 cells because you're looking toward antibody production and humoral immunity, there's no reason to make Th1 cells. That would be counterproductive. So what promotes one pathway inhibits the other in terms of Th1 versus Th2. That's very high yield, so keep that in the back of your mind. Now, in addition, you can also create Th17 cells. And all you need to worry about for exams is what promotes this pathway. Don't worry about what inhibits this pathway. TGF-beta and IL-6 promote the differentiation from undifferentiated helper T0 cells into Th17 cells. And once you have Th17, it's very important to know that this recruits neutrophils. So when you think Th1, think macrophages. When you think Th17, think neutrophils. When you think Th2, think antibodies. Lastly, you can go from undifferentiated helper T cells or Th0 cells to what's known as Tregs. TGF-beta encourages Th0 to differentiate into Tregs. And once you have Tregs, the reason that it's called a reg is because it regulates immunity, specifically autoimmunity. So the presence of Tregs inhibit autoimmunity to prevent all of these various T cell responses from accidentally destroying things that it's not supposed to destroy. So this is really important to know because this is your differentiation pathways of the various helper T cells. That's it for this video. Much more immunology to come. I hope that this was helpful to you.